Namma Bengaluru. I don't know if I have the privilege to actually say that. However, um, I truly and deeply feel so. Bangalore is the land of my first job. First on my own experience, first love, first heartbreak, um, first screw up the database and entirely delete the database and screw it up for the entire team, learn accountability, first appraisal, first promotion and many more firsts. So it is truly special. Why am I telling all this? Today, we're gonna talk about ownership of identity. Identity is a uniquely human concept. It's that ineffable eye of self-consciousness. Something that we all understand. Who are you? What's your name? Where do you live? What experiences have you had? Identity can have many interpretations. And yet, our modern world has muddled this concept of identity as people often interact with others that we do, do not usually know. And hence, the ability to provide a trusted proof of your identity is essential to daily life. Today, nations and corporations conflate driver licenses, social security numbers, Aadhaar numbers, and other state-issued credentials as identity. And this is problematic because that means that your very identity can be taken away from you, can be revoked if that's what states want. And even if you just cross a border, I believe in an inclusive, autonomous, equitable, and above all, a humanitarian world. And hence, it should be beyond passport, Aadhaars, Google IDs, or even Facebook IDs. Hello, everyone. I am Priya Guliani. And I promise the girl on the first slide was also me. So I'm the EMEA Director for Government Blockchain Association. We're a global organization working towards promotion of blockchain technology so people understand what it is and how they can adopt it rationally and ethically. My role entails strategy, roadmap, and expansion across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I'm also the CEO at Earth ID. We're a multi-award-winning, decentralized identity platform. Our vision is to drive social, financial, and digital inclusion through the power of self-sovereign digital identity. I'm passionate about inclusion, and hence, digital identity is a very, very crucial topic for me. I co-authored this book, Impact of Women's Empowerment on the SDGs in the Digital Era, with a few phenomenal women, and I particularly share my thoughts around how digital identity can be a crucial element for social and financial inclusion. I'm an MIT certified Oxford leadership professional and blockchain expert. I've worked with global brands like Apple, Santander, and Zurich Insurance. I've been awarded Women in Leadership by GCPIT, Phenomenal She by INBA, and Exceptional Women of Excellence by WEF. This year, on International Women's Day, I was featured as a rising star in the Women in FinTech category by Innovate Finance UK. And finally, I've, meant, I've been mentored by the best, and I keep the chain of gratitude going, and I totally believe everybody should. I'm a mentor with Startup Chile, Women in Tech, and European Women on Boards. Grateful to the entrepreneur for this spectacular event, Ritu and Priya for this gracious opportunity, and our incredible host for tying it all together. All data on slide, but an estimated 1.5 billion people worldwide do not have a basic ID credentials, and hence can be denied access to government services, health, financial services, labor market, ability to own a property, or even register a business. These have been named as the invisible people. Yes, you heard it right, the invisible people. Painful, isn't it? How many times do you actually take out your ID card, look at it in awe, and feel that, wow, I'm so blessed that I have a digital identity or just an identity, right? Never. IDs are certainly taken for granted by those who have them, but lack of identification creates barriers for the people, individuals affected, and even the countries that they live in. Another estimate by McKenzie here on the slide 
is that 3.4 billion people have some form of identity but have limited ability to use it in the digital world. What is the scale of the internet? How do you quantify the size of this dynamic, ever-growing behemoth? The internet was built without standards, especially as far as the processes related to user management are concerned. There's no universally accepted user identity management protocol. The approach is silo-based. What that means, every entity retains and maintains its own database and the same user across multiple platforms or entities is mapped differently. This not only makes the process of knowledge transfer really, really inefficient and costly, but also makes the data itself vulnerable. And of course, numerous data breaches are made public every year, exposing billions of records. The number of users actually that were impacted by data breaches in 21 more than quadruples than in 2020. India has the third largest number of users compromised after the US and Iran. Information was stolen from nine big data breaches, including Domino's India and Air India. Some statistics on frauds are here on the screen. So even equipped with the best security standards in the industry, identity frauds persist. A perpetual game of cat and mouse that has just become so difficult to mitigate in this increasingly digital landscape, of course. The IN identity. In the analog world, anyone who wants to prove or confirm their identity usually pulls out their ID card when going to the authorities, visiting a bar, or just going to the bank account to open a bank account, we can confirm our identity this way. After presentation, the ID card goes back into the wallet, and hence we have a sense of feeling that we have regained control over it. However, anyone who moves around on the internet for shopping, consulting with a bank, identifies themselves digitally. When placing an order online, replying to an email, or just doing a social media post, you're actually leaving behind data that the provider stores and manages. What sounds super, super convenient, however, is a security risk. Because we're not only presenting our data, it's being processed, it's being stored. As the digital world becomes increasingly important to the physical world, it also presents a new opportunity, an opportunity to, to define and a possibility of redefining modern concepts of identity. It might allow us to place our identity back in our control and hence, re reuniting the ineffable I to our identity. The big question is, how do we own, how do we control, how do we manage, and how do we represent ourselves in the digital world independently of some big tech giants? In recent years, the redefinition of identity has begun to have a new name self-sovereign identity. So how did we get here? We started off with a centralized system, which is predominant today as well, wherein companies and governments store our data in silos, of course, and we have to trust them to keep our information safe and secure. Traditional centralized identification systems are insecure, fragmented, and exclusionary. And we've seen all of that, right? Centralized identity databases are at risk as they often become prime targets or even as we call them honeypots for hackers. Then came along the federated identity management where multiple organizations decide that we'll use a sim same digital identity to give access across networks. Think Google sign on, Facebook sign on. Of course, federated identity management systems have obvious advantage over centralized ones because you do not have to remember the 100,000 credentials that you currently do right now. However, it comes with its own disadvantages. Coming on to self-sovereign identity, a digital identity that lets you have control over your identity data that can be used across multiple platforms, across entities without sacrificing you security, or even sacrificing your own user experience. It safeguards privacy by removing the need to store personal information 
on a central database and gives individuals control of all the information that they have and they want to share. We look at, of course, how it works. In a self-sovereign identity model, the users manage and control their own identity information using a digital ID wallet. Digital ID wallet is a private space that is for each and every one of you associated to a single user. The user is at the center of the ecosystem of identity issuers and the service providers. Basically, all your credentials, your identity, your educational, your financial, your tax records, etc., can sit on your wallet. And all the interactions happen through that wallet, so it provides a unified way of doing all of this. The user is also able to selectively share information, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but let's look at how it truly works in a corporate world. So this is how Earth ID has solved the identity challenge, a digital wallet that works just like your physical wallet, but with greater security, keeping a trail of who took what data, why, and for how long, and giving the individual the ownership and control over data a self-sovereign identity. The digital wallet is stored on your mobile device, hence you have it on your fingertips. You can add your education, your identity documents, your travel and finance documents. So the question is, where does this digital evidence come from? It comes from the authorities, from the governments, from the valid institutions, as well as from the individuals who have the right authority to provide one, the trustworthy issuers of proof of identity. The third role in this digital ecosystem is played by the relying parties who basically want to verify the digital identity of each one of you in order to provide you an access to a service. The bottom line, you as the identity holder decide whether you want to share that information for how long and for what purposes, right? And also you have the ability to revoke that ability or permission at any time. The underlying trust anchor for Earth ID is Hedera, providing an immutable proof of claims and credentials, creating a loosely coupled mechanism between the issuers and verifiers, and of course, acting as a revocation registry in case of a credential becomes obsolete. As you can think, the possibilities are endless. Self-sovereign identity enables trusted interactions across industries and across ecosystems. No cyberbullying, no bots on social media, no misinformation on social media. Frictionless access to banking and financial services. Unified access to humanitarian services beyond borders. Breezing through airport and security check-ins. And as we learned yesterday from so many of the exemplary speakers, Seamless adoption of Web 3.0 and metaverse-based ecosystems. Earth ID is transforming how people interact with financial services, apply for employment, and access digital ecosystems. And finally, why you should care about all of this? Let me tell you a short story. A colleague or a friend in the UK, he worries a lot. He has a young teenage daughter and he feels that when he's out partying, a security guard is gonna ask for an identity information, he's gonna memorize the address, and she lives alone, so there is a threat that he could just show up at her house. Moral of the story, dads around the world are jittery, anxious about their daughter's safety. With a self-sovereign identity solution, the girl can prove that she is 18 plus, or an adult, or whatever she wants to prove in terms of an age barrier, that she is eligible for this service without actually showing the birth certificate or an identity card that has the whole address, name, and birth date on it. And you can think of multiple other ways, right? The other example would be you could prove affordability without showing your bank account balance, and which is going to be revolutionary. The really interesting thing is also from a wealth creation perspective. As the saying goes, if you don't have to pay for a service or a product, then you are the product yourself. And this has really manifested itself over the years where organizations are providing services and products for free in exchange for the ability to access, store, repurpose, and even monetize the information of your data and your credentials. That said, if individuals 
had the ability to safeguard and restrict access to their personal data, this shifts the power dynamic back to user. And hence, you can basically, the rise of self-sovereign self identity will actually help the creators and the actual owners of the data to be valued for it, to be actually mon to get monetized for it, and to create wealth. And finally, I think I want to add that the true power of self-sovereign identity can be unleashed once it is embedded across all bodies of society, requiring all players, for example, governments, regulators, service providers, to take up the SSI baton and become part of the change. And it's a wrap. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Priya Guliani. Thank you for your time today.